Okay, so picture this. You drive past some huge office building, maybe a big shopping center, and you think, wow, imagine owning a piece of that. But, I mean, historically, that wasn't really possible for most people, right? Not at all. That was pretty much reserved for, you know, big institutions or the yeah. very wealthy. The barrier to entry was just immense capital yeah. knowledge. Exactly. But then along came this thing called securitization, sort of like financial magic, turning these physical, illiquid buildings into things you can actually trade on an exchange. And that just opened the floodgates. Yeah. Which is exactly what you asked us to look into today. Mm. We've got all this material you sent over on publicly traded real estate securities. Yeah, and our job, as always, is to sick through it, find the really crucial stuff, and, well, help make sense of it all for you. So we're going to break down the main ways you can invest in real estate through the public markets. And, maybe more importantly, how analysts actually try to figure out what these things are worth. Sounds good. Let's jump in. So, public real estate securities, they basically give you a way into owning real estate equity or debt indirectly. That securitization is the key piece. It's what makes it accessible, really, for almost any investor, not just the big players. So looking at the materials, it seems like there are three main types we should probably focus on. Yeah, that's right. First up, and probably the ones people have heard of most, are REITs, real estate investment trusts. Right. These are basically companies whose main business is owning, operating, sometimes financing uh, properties that produce income. And the really defining thing about REITs usually is that rule about paying out income, right? Like almost all of it. Exactly. They generally have to distribute, say, 90% or even 100% of their taxable income to shareholders as dividends. Which often means they get a big tax break at the company level. That's the trade-off. They often avoid corporate income tax because they pass the income through. And you've got different flavors like equity REITs owning the actual buildings and mortgage REITs focusing more on the debt side, the loans. Okay, so REITs. Think income, think tax advantages. Got it. What's the second category then? Those are RACs, real estate operating companies. Uh, think of these as just regular taxable corporations that happen to be in the real estate business. So like if a country doesn't have REIT rules, or maybe the company does stuff that REITs aren't allowed to do, like a lot of development. Precisely. They don't have those strict payout requirements like REITs, so they can hang on to more of their earnings, readjust them back into the business. Mm -hmm. More flexibility, you could say. But they pay corporate taxes like a normal company. Correct. No special tax pass-through. Okay, REITs for income pass-through, RECs for maybe more reinvestment flexibility. And the third one takes us over to the debt side of things. Right, mortgage-backed securities. Hmm. MBS. These are basically pools of mortgage loans packaged up into a security that investors can buy. You're buying the rights to the cash flows from those underlying mortgages. And that includes both home loans, residential MBS or RMBS, yep. and loans on commercial properties, CMBS. Exactly. And one thing you flagged is the pool size difference. RMBS, you know, thousands of home loans typically. Mm -hmm. CMBS pools can be much smaller, maybe just a few big commercial loans, sometimes even just one massive one. It's really amazing how these structures just blew the doors open for real estate investing. It really is. I mean, REITs or similar structures are in something like, what, almost 40 countries now? Mm -hmm. And they even got their own GICS sector in the S&P 500. Which tells you something about how mainstream they've become. And people often look to them for dividends, right? Maybe more stable income compared to some other stocks. Yeah, that potential for higher, more stable dividend income is definitely a, a big part of the appeal for many investors. Okay, so that's the landscape. But how do you actually value these things, particularly the REITs and REOCs? Yeah. The sources mention a few ways. Asset value, multiples. Right. A really important one, especially you see a lot in Europe and Asia, is net asset value per share, NEVPS. Oh, okay. This tries to estimate the real market value of everything the company owns, subtracts the liabilities, and then divides by the number of shares. Which makes sense because the accounting book value, especially under U.S. rules using historical cost, that could be way off from what the properties are actually worth today. Totally off, potentially. Mm. Historical cost just doesn't track market reality for assets like real estate that can appreciate. NAVPS tries to use current market values instead. And why is this particularly useful for real estate companies? Well, because unlike maybe some other industries, there is an active, albeit not perfect liquid, private market for the underlying assets, the buildings themselves. You can look at what similar properties have recently sold for. Ah, okay. So you have real-world transaction data to benchmark against. Exactly. It gives you a reference point for estimating the value of the properties the REIT or REOC holds. 
So conceptually, how does that NAV calculation work? Walk us through it. Okay, so you start with the income the property generate, that's usually net operating income or NOI. Basically your gross rental income, less vacancy, less the direct operating expenses, property taxes, insurance, maintenance, utilities, that sort of thing. Crucially, it's before debt payments, income taxes, or depreciation. Got it. Just the raw operating profit from the property itself. Right. But the NOI you see on the financial statements might need some tweaking for valuation. Like what? Well, sometimes accounting rules make reported rent different from cash rent received. Like, if rents step up over the lease term, accounting might straight line it. You'd often adjust that out to get closer to cash NOI. Okay, remove the non-cash stuff. Yeah. And you might also adjust for, say, recent property acquisitions to show what the NOI would look like on a full-year basis for the current portfolio. Makes sense. Get a stable, forward-looking income figure. Then you take that adjusted NOI and you capitalize it. You divide it by a market cap rate. Okay, what's the cap rate again? It's basically the expected rate of return, or yield, yeah. that investors are demanding for similar properties in the private market based on recent deals. Dividing NOI by the cap rate gives you an estimated market value for those income-producing properties. So NOI divided by cap rate equals property value. That's the core of it. That's the biggest piece, yeah. Then you add in the market value of any other tangible assets the company has, maybe cash, accounts receivable, land they hold for future development. But not intangible stuff like goodwill. Generally, no. You're focused on the tangible asset value. Then you subtract the company's total liabilities. Ideally at market value, but often book value of debt is used as a proxy. Any catches with the liabilities. One common adjustment is to exclude things like deferred tax liabilities. The idea is these aren't usually expected to require a cash payment anytime soon, or maybe ever, unless the assets are sold. Right, so market value of assets minus market value of liabilities gives you the net asset value, the NAV. Bingo. And then divide that NAV by the total number of shares outstanding and you get NAV per share, or NAVPS. Okay, so let's say a REIT is trading at $50 a share, but we calculate its NAVPS to be $60. Does that just automatically mean it's a bargain, undervalued? Well, it suggests it might be trading at a discount to the underlying asset value, but it's not quite that simple. Shares can trade at a premium or a discount to NAVPS for lots of reasons. Such as, what might justify a premium, for example? Maybe the market expects really good things from management, like they're great at development or making smart acquisitions that create value beyond just owning the buildings. Or maybe the company has a pipeline of projects the market is excited about. And a discount. Could be the opposite. Concerns about management, maybe high leverage, poor governance, or just negative sentiment in the stock market compared to the private property market. Sometimes private appraisals lag too, you know. And I guess if a company's stock is trading below its NAVPS, that could actually hurt its ability to grow. Absolutely. If they need to raise money by selling new shares, and those shares are priced below NAVPS, it dilutes the value for existing shareholders, makes it harder to fund good opportunities. So NAPS is useful, but it sounds like it's maybe more of a relative tool sometimes, comparing discounts across companies. That's a very common use case, comparing yeah. the premium or discount across peers, or analysts might flip it around, use the current stock price to back calculate an implied cap rate for the portfolio and see if that looks reasonable compared to market cap rates. But estimating NAV must get tricky if the portfolio is really complex or the market is choppy. Oh, definitely. It's an estimate. Always. It gets much harder with, say, specialized properties, lots of undeveloped land, complex joint ventures, or just when the private transaction market itself is illiquid, there's subjectivity involved. Okay, so NAV is one big piece focused on asset value, but you also mentioned looking at operating performance. That brings us to FFO and AFO. Right. Funds from Operations, FFO, and Adjusted Funds from Operations, AFO. These are really key metrics for REITs, used a lot for comparing companies using multiples, like price to FFO or price to AFO, kind of like a PE ratio for REITs. And why do we need these special measures? Why not just use regular net income like other companies? The big issue is depreciation. Accounting rules make you deduct depreciation expense for buildings. But in reality, real estate often holds its value or even goes up over time. So subtracting depreciation can give a misleading picture of a REIT's actual cash generating ability. Ah, uh, okay. Depreciation is a non-cash charge that doesn't reflect the economics of appreciating assets. So FO tries to fix that. 
Exactly. The basic FFO calculation starts with net income, then adds back that real estate depreciation and amortization. It also adjusts for gains or losses on property sales, since those aren't part of the ongoing recurring operations. Okay, so add back depreciation, take out property sale profits or losses. That gets you to FFO. That's the standard FFO. Yeah. Now, AFFO, sometimes called cash available for distribution or CAD, tries to refine it even further. How so? It takes FFO and makes a couple more key adjustments. It usually subtracts that non-cash straight-line rent adjustment we talked about earlier to get closer to actual cash rent. Right, get back to cash. And crucially, it also subtracts recurring capital expenditures the money needed just to maintain the properties. You mean like replacing roofs, HVAC systems, paying for tenant improvements when leases turn over, leasing commissions, stuff you have to spend to keep the income flowing. Exactly that, it's the maintenance capex. AFO tries to show the cash flow left over after paying for the upkeep required to sustain the current level of income. Hmm. So AFO sounds like it should be a better indicator of like the sustainable cash flow the REIT generates and maybe its ability to pay dividends. Conceptually, yes. Many analysts think AFO is a better measure of true economic income and dividend capacity because it accounts for those necessary reinvestments in the existing assets. There's always a but. But it's harder to calculate consistently. Estimating that recurring maintenance capex figure can be subjective and varies between analysts and companies. That's why FFO, being more standardized, is often more widely reported and used by data providers. Okay, so we use FFO and AFO, calculate multiples like PFO or PFO. When we compare these multiples across different REITs, what makes one trade higher than another? Generally, you're looking at three main drivers. First is growth expectations. Okay. Does the company have a good development pipeline? There's properties in fast-growing areas. Does management have a great track record? Higher expected growth usually means a higher multiple. Makes sense. What's second? Risk. The perceived riskiness of the cash flows. Think about property type apartments are usually seen as less risky than, say, hotels. Property quality, location, tenant strength all play into this. Lower risk generally equals a higher multiple. And third? Leverage and capital structure. How much debt does the company have? More debt means more financial risk, which usually leads to a lower multiple. Also, how easily can the company access capital for future growth? That's right. important too, especially for REITs paying out most of their income. We also saw EBITDA mentioned as another comparison tool. Yeah, enterprise value to EBITDA. EBITDA is often used as a rough proxy for NOI in these calculations. And if you flip it, EBITDA divided by EV gives you something that approximates the overall cap rate of the portfolio. So you can compare that implied cap rate to actual market cap rates. Exactly. Another relative value check. But even FFO and AFO aren't perfect, right? They have blind spots. For sure. They focus on current income. Mm -hmm. So they might not capture the value of things like empty land held for future development or properties with rents way below market rates that have potential upside. And like we said, AFFO calculations can differ, and both can sometimes be skewed by one-off items if you're not careful. The materials used an example, Capital Shopping Center REIT, CSC, to kind of illustrate this analysis in practice. Right. It showed how you'd look at CSC's multiples, PFFO, PFFO, debt levels, and compare them to its peers, to the broader REIT market. But not just the numbers in isolation, you'd also consider why they might be different. Like, CSC's focus on defensive assets, or its strong position in the Washington, D.C. market, maybe management's track record. Precisely. It's about understanding the story behind the numbers. What are the company's strengths, weaknesses, strategy, market dynamics? That context is crucial for interpreting the valuation multiples. Okay, this is super helpful for understanding the public side, but let's switch gears a bit. How does investing this way through REITs or REOCs stack up against, you know, investing directly in buildings, maybe through a private fund or just buying a property yourself? Yeah, that's a fundamental comparison. Public versus private real estate, they're really different animals, and big investors often use both. Each has its own set of pros and cons. So what are the big wins for going public REITs, REOCs, compared to private? Number one is probably liquidity. Being able to buy and sell shares easily on an exchange, that's huge compared to selling a building or getting out of a private fund, which can take a long, long time. Yeah, liquidity is a big one. What else? Transparency is generally much higher. You get regular financial reporting, public share prices, lots of analyst coverage. You also get instant diversification. One share gives you a piece of many properties, tenants, locations. Plus professional management running the show. Right. And for REITs, that tax efficiency at the corporate level, lower investment minimums are also key for smaller investors. 
and you have limited liability, more regulation. Okay, so liquidity, transparency, diversification, access to management, lower minimums, seems like a lot of advantages. What are the downsides then compared to private? Volatility is a big one. Stock prices can swing wildly based on overall market sentiment, not just real estate fundamentals. So public REITs tend to have much higher short-term volatility than private real estate valuations. Which means they might not give you the same portfolio diversification benefits, at least in the short run. Exactly. Short-term correlation with the broader stock market can be quite high. Hmm. Also, the REIT structure itself with that high payout requirement limits how much cash they can retain for growth. They often have to tap the markets for capital. And they might be restricted in what they can do. Yeah. Yeah. Less flexibility in terms of development or other business lines compared to a private operator. And a really key point, the shares can trade at a big discount to NAV. You don't really have that issue when you own the building directly. Its value is its value, more or less, unless you're forced to sell in a down market. And the dividends often get taxed at higher ordinary income rates. That could be a factor too, yeah. Plus compliance costs, potential agency issues between management and shareholders. Okay, so that's the public side's drawbacks. Let's flip it. What are the advantages of going the private route? Well, you get direct exposure to the property itself, its specific performance. The valuations tend to be smoother, less volatile day to day, which offers better diversification against public market swings. And more control. If you own it directly, absolutely, you make the decisions. Even in a fund, the focus is purely on real estate operations. You might also capture an illiquidity premium, potentially higher returns as compensation for tying up your capital. And maybe more strategic flexibility. For sure. Private players can pursue strategies like heavy development and quick sales, merchant building, that REITs often can't. And there can be certain tax advantages, like maybe more aggressive depreciation or deferring taxes through exchanges. Sounds good, but private investing has its own hurdles, obviously. Oh, yeah. Illiquidity is the big one. Getting your money out can be tough and take time. Fees in private funds can be pretty hefty. Appraisals, which drive private valuations, can lag behind actual market movements, both up and down. Less regulation, too, right? Generally, less regulation and fewer investor protections compared to public markets. And the entry barriers are high, huge investment minimums, often only open to accredited investors. Less transparency is also common. And returns often depend heavily on using a lot of debt. Leverage is often a key driver of high returns in private equity real estate which of course also increases risks significantly. So it really sounds like there's no single best way. It's about trade-offs. Exactly. It depends entirely on the investor's goals, their need for liquidity, risk tolerance, time horizon, capital amount. Public offers liquidity and accessibility, but with market volatility. Private offers potentially smoother returns and direct control, but it's illiquid and less accessible. And sometimes the public market gets really cheap compared to private values or vice versa, creating opportunities. Precisely. Those disconnects between public market pricing, like trading below NAV, and private market values are something sophisticated investors definitely watch. Wow. Okay. We've definitely covered a, a lot of ground here. We started with the different vehicles, REITs, REOCs, MBS that let you get into real estate via public market. Yep. Then we dug into valuation, the NAV approach, looking at the underlying assets, mm. and then the cash flow approach using FFO and AFFO and why those metrics are so important for REITs specifically. And we wrapped up comparing the whole public market approach versus private real estate investing, laying out those key differences in liquidity, control, transparency, and volatility. Hopefully that gives you a much clearer framework for thinking about publicly traded real estate, the lingo, the valuation methods, and how it fits into the broader investment landscape. Definitely. So here's a final thought to maybe mull over. Given these different ways of looking at value NAV based on assets, FOAFO based on cash flow, and the very different characteristics of public versus private real estate, how do you prioritize? When you think about getting exposure to real estate, mm -hmm. what's the single biggest factor that weighs most heavily in your decision on how to do it? Is it liquidity, control, valuation levels, yeah. something else entirely? What really drives that choice for your situation? 